Okay, so it is uh, four minutes after. Let's go ahead and get started and we'll just let folks join us. This is being recorded. Um, and so you guys will get the recording of this sent to you via email. Um, so before we get started, um, we'll just do some quick uh, introductions, um, followed by a quick slide deck that will go over basic information regarding admissions and applications to the program. After that, we'll jump into Q&A. There is a Q&A forum, so we do ask that you submit your question in the Q&A versus chat. It helps us to be able to track questions easier um, versus the chat. And there's also an upvote feature in the Q&A. So if you are looking through and you see someone has um, asked the same question or a very similar question to what you have in mind, please go ahead and upvote it and we'll get that answered for you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just gonna, we'll go in the order that I'm seeing everybody on my screen, which is going from left to right. Um, I will go last, of course, but we'll go with Morgan, Desiree, Lisa, Vivica, Robin. So Morgan, take us away. Hi everyone, my name is Morgan. I am the Graduate Admissions Specialist for the Department of Computer Science. Hi, I'm Desiree. I am one of the academic advisors for the MCS MCSDS program. Hello, my name is Lisa Jagoda, and I'm also one of the academic advisors for the online MCS MCSDS. Hi, everyone. My name is Viveka Kudeligam, and I'm the assistant director for computer science graduate programs. And hi, everybody. I'm Robin Kravitz. I'm a professor here in the department, and I am currently the director of graduate studies for all of our graduate programs, including our online MCS program, as well as our on campus MS, MCS, and PhD programs. And I've been here in the department for over 20 years. So uh, hopefully, I can answer departmental type questions, although these guys are the experts on the, uh, the program. So uh, I'll be here if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Robin. Uh, my name is Christine Martinez. I'm the coordinator for online programs um, in computer science. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and just stop share. Here. All right. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yep. Oh, excellent. Okay. So again, this is the online MCS and CSDS admissions webinar. Um, so we're just going to go through these and as you have questions, drop them into the Q&A. Our team of advisors and Morgan will answer them as well as Vivica and maybe Robin. We'll see. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. So first up, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So today we're going to cover application requirements, um, including application requirements for international students. We'll go over briefly tuition and financial aid. We do have a set of FAQs. Um, we'll go over application deadlines and where to find information. So next up, um, what are we looking for in the application? Um, so the diversity in this program is, is, is quite wide. So really we're looking for individuals with um, professional backgrounds who are you know, multidisciplinary, multifunction, and some programming. Um, academic wise, um, Individuals have to have a bachelor's degree to be able to apply and be admitted into a graduate program. Um, the bachelor's degree does not need to be in computing, but it does need to include a data structures course. Uh, the GPA requirement is going to be a minimum of a 3.0 out of a 4.0 um, or higher. And in terms of program ability, the prerequisites for that really are, you know, is data structures, algorithms, and object-oriented programming. So we'd really like to see those on the academic transcripts. Um, most students know Python, but it also helps to know C++ or Java. And then mathematical ability, uh, really you should have a strong foundation in linear algebra and basic statistics and probability. Um, and then going further into the programming ability, uh, we do offer a data structures proficiency exam for online MCS. So the data structures proficiency exam is designed to provide a pathway to admissions for prospective applicants to the program 
who already have a bachelor's degree per se, but not necessarily in CS or if they don't have the prerequisite courses on their transcripts. So prospective applicants who are interested in taking the data structures proficiency exam should double check that they meet all of the other basic requirements um, for application for the application um, for both online MCS and MCSDS. Um, and that, you know, we do want to make you aware that passing the exam does not guarantee admission nor is it required for admission, um, but it is an option that is available to help strengthen your application. So if you take the DS exam and you get a passing grade, um, be sure you are also have all of the other uh, requisite requirements on the application um, for admission. Um, the exam details are found um, here under application process and requirements page on the program website. And then for those who are needing a review, we also offer the advanced CS fundamental specialization, which covers these topics, and that is found in Coursera. Uh, next up, we'll go over application requirements. Uh, I believe Desiree is going to cover this for us. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is to complete an application. The application can be found either um, on a link through our program page on the CS website or through the graduate college, you can create an application there. The application fee is $70 for domestic students, $90 for international students. Um, it is encouraged that students submit three letters of recommendation. This is not a requirement. Um, but it is a preference. Um, and these letters should be either professional or academic. Um, the letter should speak to your abilities in CS. Um, so if you've mostly had some work experience in CS um, or have been out of school for a long time, letters from your supervisor would be appropriate. If you're newly graduated um, and maybe have more of that CS academic background, faculty would be uh, fine for that as well. The statement of purpose is optional as well. And here is a place where you can talk about um, why, or why you're a good fit for the program, um, how you see this program working for your professional goals. Um, you will need to submit a CV or a resume. Um, and then this is also um, needed for the TOEFL and ILETS waivers. Um, you need to submit your transcript. So for the application, um, an unofficial transcript is required. And then if you are offered admissions, you will need to submit an official transcript to the graduate college. So for the transcripts, what's required is it needs to be a legible copy. So if you can't read it whenever you upload it, we won't be able to read it either. Um, and then it needs to be a list of all of the courses that you have taken. Um, so bachelor's degree, if you have a previous master's or um, a PhD, you'll also need to upload those as well. If you are coming from a country that has the transcripts listed in something other than English, you'll need to upload uh, a copy in the native language and then also an English translation. Um, and then it needs to be the full transcript um, and then also a certificate of degree if that is not listed on the transcript itself. And then for standardized tests, we do not require either the GRE or the GMAT. Okay. And then let's see. Additional requirements for international students. I believe this one. Is this one you also, Desiree? No, okay, I will cover this one. Or is that you, Lisa? Yeah, I'll cover this. So, okay, perfect, thank uh, you. Yeah, so we do have some additional requirements for international students. Um, the link here from the Graduate College will show you your minimum requirements by country. I believe Morgan's putting all of these links in the chat for you to, to follow. So if you did, um, your bachelor's um, degree in another country, um, you can go to this link and find out what the minimum GPA requirement would be for your country and what some um, equivalent eligible degrees are. Um, in addition to that, this link will tell you if TOEFL is required or one of the other um, English proficiency exams. Okay. And then we have more information about internet, uh, requirements for international students. Um, yeah, so um, 
the, the, yeah, the big thing here is the um, English proficiency exams. So for applicants whose native language is not um, English, um, English proficiency is required. So the best way to show English proficiency is through one of the um, exams. Um, the exams that are accepted are TOEFL IBT with a minimum score of 103, the IELTS academic exam with a minimum score of 7.5, or the Duolingo exam, which is um, sort of a temporary exam um, for uh, tests taken just between February 1st, 2020 through August 1st, 2022. And the minimum score required there is a 125. For all of these exams, your score must be less than two years old to be eligible. Um, and that's two years from the term for which you're applying. So if you're applying for our upcoming cycle, which is spring 2022, so that term begins in January. So any TOEFL exam or any of these exams taken prior to January 2020 would no longer be um, eligible. Um, a few other ways to show English proficiency are through exemption waivers. Um, we offer an exemption waiver both um, either for um, educational history, if you've um, recently graduated or attended um, at least two full-time years in a country where English is the primary language, um, if you've yeah, completed a bachelor's degree or done um, a master's degree in a country where English is uh, the primary language, you would qualify for an educational exemption. There's also a waiver um, possible for um, employment history in a country where English is the primary language. Um, for that, you have to be currently employed in, in one of those eligible countries and have been working for at least two years. Um, this is a very nuanced topic. So if you have any questions at all about whether or not you meet English proficiency, we would prefer that you definitely reach out to us via email and we can help explain um, if, you, if you're meeting English proficiency or if you need to take an exam or if you might qualify for a waiver. So yeah, reach out to our email if you have any questions. Great. Okay, tuition and financial aid. And I think this one is you also, Lisa. Yes. All right, so tuition for the online MCS, MCSDS is $670 per credit hour. Um, so that is a total of $21,440 for the complete 32 credit hour degree. Um, tuition is paid per semester. So it's based on the number of classes that you're taking each semester. Um, most students will take one or two courses per semester. So they would only owe the tuition for one or two courses. Um, a question we get a lot regarding tuition and fees is, um, you know, am I able to take a semester off? And do I owe any money if I take a semester off? The answer is no for this program. Um, tuition is only due if you're actually registered for a course. Um, if you want to take the semester off, we just ask that you let us know in advance and that's fine to, um, to take a short break. Um, as far as financial aid goes, the Department of Computer Science does not offer any research or teaching assistantships to students in online programs, including the MCSDS, um, and we don't offer any sort of scholarships. And then finally, for this um, sponsor billing or third party billing is something that is offered by the university's bursar's office. So this is when some or all of a student's tuition and fees are paid by a sponsoring organization, such as your employer. So to check if you and your employer may qualify to participate in sponsor billing, um, there is um, information on the Bursar's Office website here at this link. Great, thank you, Lisa. All right, so those are the basics. Now we're going to jump into FAQ. Um, and also these are um, available on the program website, these FAQs. Um, so what is online MCS? 
and what is the online MCS DS? So the online MCS is a, a curriculum-based um, master in computer science offered by the computer science department. The courses are offered in the program are the same courses that are offered on campus. Um, it's 32 credit hours. You have students enrolled in the program have up to five years to complete the degree. Uh, the MCSDS is the same degree as MCS, except with the option to focus on a data science track. The data science track is offered by the department. Um, let's see, next question. What will appear on the diploma or the transcript? Desiree. Uh, so what's going to be on the diploma is it's going to be um, a Master of Computer Science degree. And this is the same degree that is given to the on-campus students that are in the MCS program. Uh, the transcript will also say that it is a Master of Computer Science program. And it's the same diploma and transcript both for the MCS and the MCSDS. Okay. Um, how is an online MCS offered using the Coursera MOOC platform? And how are the online MCS courses different than the typical Coursera MOOC courses? Uh, so for this program, we do use the Coursera platform to deliver the courses. Um, it allows us to deliver at scale. Um, the difference between these um, MCS courses in a regular MOOC or massive open online course is that these courses in the degree program are for credit. Students register through the university registration system. They're assessed tuition for these courses if they are giving credit for these courses when they successfully complete them. Whereas a MOOC, um, anybody can open for, you know, anybody can register for a MOOC and it's up, you know, incumbent on the student on whether or not they want to complete it to receive a certificate or not. And MOOC courses are not for credit and they do not count towards the degree. Okay, let's see. Do the two uh, Coursera MOOC courses uh, and four credit portion need to be taken concurrently? Lisa? Oh, I think you're muted. It's not required to take the um, MOOC courses and the four credit portion concurrently, but we do recommend that. So um, what this is referring to is, um, on Coursera, there are some specializations um, that are affiliated with online MCS courses. So we have a cloud computing specialization and a data mining specialization. Um, and some of the content in those um, aligns with content in some of our four credit courses um, on those topics, data mining and cloud computing. Um, so you know, if you're planning to apply for the program and take these courses, we would recommend um, taking them together, um, taking the four credit versions of the courses so that you can earn graduate credit. So that kind of leads into the next question of will I earn graduate credit at the University of Illinois for completing a Coursera specialization? The answer is no, you have to be enrolled in the four credit version of those courses in order to earn graduate credit towards your degree. So that's a good reason to take them concurrently. Um, if you do want a preview of what some of our courses are like, um, they are available to the public um, as open uh, courses on Coursera. Um, so you can check them out in advance. But um, yeah, like I said, if you're applying for the program, you should plan to take the, the four credit versions of those courses. Great, thank you. All right. Um... Continuing on with FAQs, um, are students expected to be proficient in a particular programming language? Um, so students are expected to be proficient programmers to be admitted to the program, um, especially at the master's level, students are expected, expected to learn new pr programming languages on their own as needed. Um, and each course um, will have specific language requirements um, for instance, um, applied machine learning, students should be proficient in R, um, whereas statistical programming is also an R base, um, but some courses use C++ or Java. Um, and the reason it's important to be proficient in programming is the courses do not teach the programming languages. 
Um, and so really you should have that foundational knowledge um, before applying to the program. Um, let's see, how do students apply for the online MCS or MCSDS, Desiree? Yeah, uh, so students need, or applicants need to fill out the application that can either be found on um, the CS program website for our program um, or through the graduate college website. Um, and then you need to apply by the posted deadline for spring 22. That deadline is October 15th. Okay. Um, what if my undergraduate GPA is less than a 3.0 out of a 4.0? So university policy requires that um, a 3.0 uh, or that the GPA be a 3.0 or higher for the last two years of the undergraduate degree. Uh, students that are admitted to the MCS program typically have a GPA of a 3.2 or higher. The admissions committee will review borderline cases um, that show exceptional um, achievements, um, but the likelihood of GPA is less than 3.0 being admitted to the program is low, is low due to the competitiveness of the pool. Um, so applicants who don't meet that 3.0 GPA um, should assess themselves and see if they would be a competitive applicant for the program. Okay. Um, let's see. I think, Lisa, the next couple ones are for you. Um, when do online MCS classes start? So online MCS, MCSDS classes do follow our standard academic calendar at the University of Illinois. Um, so courses are offered um, in the fall semester, spring semester, and summer um, for our upcoming term, um, application term, it's uh, spring 2022. And courses for that semester begin in January, specifically on January 18th this year. Um, and then courses for the uh, fall semester always begin in August and courses for the summer always begin in May. Um, specific dates for each uh, semester, the date each semester begins can be found um, on the academic calendar for the University of Illinois. Okay, and then um, what classes are offered for online MCS and MCSDS? Yeah, so we offer a, a wide variety of um, courses for the online program. Um, there are currently around 25 to 30 courses um, available, um, of which you have to complete eight to complete the um, MCS, MCSDS degree. So there's a variety of breadth requirements, such as um, artificial intelligence, database and information systems, graphics, HCI, um, cloud computing, parallel computing, and so on and so forth um, for our breadth areas. And then there are also a number of courses taught at the advanced level. So these are 500 level courses um, that will, in some cases, build off of our breadth courses to give you more depth into um, specific areas. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Um, let's see. Desiree, do international students in these programs receive an I-20? So to receive an I-20, students have to be issued a student visa to come and study in the United States. Um, since this program is 100% online, it does not meet the federal qualifications to uh, receive a student visa. So students are not able to receive an I-20. So that also means that they're not able to do CPT or OPT. Okay. Um, Lisa, will non-degree graduate students be able to take online MCS courses? Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> online MCS courses are open to uh, non-degree students, um, but registration is limited to the remaining capacity after our degree students have to know if you want to potentially register as a non-degree student is that you still need to meet the prerequisites for um, the coursework that you're, you're planning to take. So generally that's um, the same prerequisites that we have for application to the program, object-oriented programming, data structures and algorithms, 
um, linear algebra and a statistics course. So um, yeah, if you are interested in taking a non-degree course, make sure that you have met the prerequisites and then um, you can reach out to our, um, our online MCS email um, to get more information about the registration process and exactly what courses will be offered in the upcoming term. Um, you'd want to reach out um, a couple months in advance of the start of the term to get more details on this. Okay, great. Um, and then final question for Lisa, is financial aid available for online MCS students? So the um, Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois does not offer any sort of financial aid or scholarships or research or teaching assistantships to students enrolled in the online program. However, the um, program is um, accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Um, so domestic students um, may qualify for federal financial aid. Um, and to, if you are um, interested in that, I believe Morgan just put a link to our Office of Financial Aid in the chat. Um, you can check that out. There are, uh, there's a lot more information there about types of financial aid available. Great, thank you, Lisa. Okay, so next up, um, application deadlines. Um, so as mentioned previously, there are uh, three points of entry for online MCS, MCSDS. So we do accept applications for fall, spring, and summer. The application deadline for fall is May 30th with the decision deadline of July 15th. The application deadline for spring is October 15th with a decision deadline of November 30th. And the application deadline for summer is February 15th with a decision deadline of March 31st. And so right now we're coming up on the October 15th deadline for spring 22 admissions. So just right around the corner. Um, so if you're thinking about applying to spring 22, uh, go ahead and start wrapping that up and making it all nice and pretty so we get it and we're able to read everything in there. Um, and so we are, the decision deadline, um, as you can see, are posted there, but of note here is that that's a target deadline. We do our best to try to meet that decision deadline and have decisions out to everybody. Um, but however, given that we do review applications holistically, which means we look at everything and we try to, you know, we try to admit um, everybody as much as we can, and some applications may take longer to review. And so if you're one of those individuals and you haven't gotten a decision by the, one of these, you know, by the November 30th deadline for spring 22, please note we're making our best effort um, to see, you know, to look at everything in your application, and it's likely that it's just taking longer to review. Um, if you are, you know, if you're not, if you haven't received a decision within a day or two after the deadline, feel free to email us, and we're, we're happy to send you an update on the status of your application. All right, up next, where to find information. And so the application um, is posted to the program website, you can also access it from the grad college website. Um, there are program websites are listed here. So there's one for all in MCS, so general MCS and MCSDS. And then um, of most import for international students are requirements by country. This is super helpful and um, you know, providing you information of, of whether you require English proficiency, um, whether um, or what types of degrees are equivalent to a four-year bachelor's degree here, um, and whether or not, you know, or, and what is the GPA minimum required based on your institution. Um, TOEFL ILS waiver information um, that is found off of the program website. Again, as Lisa was saying, it's very nuanced. So if you have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, the sooner the better, um, that way we can get everything sorted out um, before we start reviewing applications. And then application deadlines is also posted. And then if you have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at online mcs at cs.illinois.edu. Uh, that concludes the slides. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. All right, and then we can jump into the Q&A. Uh, looks like the team has been doing an excellent job of answering. 
Um, and so let's just go ahead and do these live. So first up is G or GJ. Um, let's see, which courses require R specifically um, and for Python for C++ slash Java? So for um, R, the courses that require R are um, really the statistical programming course and AML. In terms of Python, Java, and um, C++, some courses have a preference of, of one of these languages, but some of the courses also will allow you to use the language that you're comfortable with. Um, we do post sample syllabus or sample syllabi for all of our courses on the program website. So we recommend um, that you pop into one of those sample syllabus to, to view what is required for that class. Uh, Robin, do you have anything to add to that or? No, it's, okay. You know, knowing the specific field and what programming language are specific for it. For example, I, you know, I assume the cloud computing class is done in C++ or even C, <laughs> right? It really just depends on the area. Uh, so really the best thing to do is to look at the website because the, the, the faculty member teaching the class is gonna pick the best programming language for that class. Perfect, thank but, you. But I think you said this before, you know, uh, our, for each of those programming languages, those languages are not taught in the class. Right, so if you feel like you're going to be taking a class that you you know how to program, but you've never programmed the language before, I ha we highly recommend that you do some type of pre-tutorial online somewhere to get yourself familiar with that language. Mm -hmm. And I think I also added in one of my responses, the expectation is when you are graduating with a master's in computer science, the expectation is that you will know the foundations and the skills that you can pick up a new language because you can't keep teaching the current language, but because things can also change, but you should be able to learn a new language if you come across something different. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, next step. Um, if one of my recommendations is not about computer science related skills, but is by someone I work closely with, with, will that recommendation still be considered? Um, yeah, so um, absolutely. We look at everything in the application that you upload or submit. And so um, everything in your application is considered. Certainly something, letters that um, refer specifically to your CS skills are, are more relevant than some that um, you know might not, but definitely there's, there may be something in there that, um, that we would consider. But I can tell you that never ask for a letter of recommendation from a family member. We do not consider those. And sadly, we see them all the time. Okay. You can only find two people to find a, get a, a recommendation letter from. Don't ask your uncle who works in some, you know, computing field. <laughs> and maybe we can add another category to that. So if, if someone reports to you, and you submit a letter from that person, there is a conflict of interest. So that might not be a great letter writer to support your application. And really, um, if it is from work, find, find a manager or someone that you actually reported to who can speak to your skills and how you um, learned this material. Mm -hmm. Instead of, for example, a coworker. So I shouldn't really go and ask Christine, for example, to write me a letter. Oh, I'd be happy to, but it would not but be. You would not be considered <laughs> to in the same extent. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, okay, next question. I have completed my Bachelor of Computer Science degree this year. And on minimum requirements by country site, it says that your bachelor's is a master's in my country. How much do you care about this? We care about this a lot. Um, <laughs> actually, and the grad college will also care about this a lot. And so and we recommend just um, uploading your transcripts to your application um, and um, we will review it. And if, you know, the graduate call, college will also review it for admissibility, but please upload all of your academic credentials because it is very important um, to ensure that um, you are meeting the requirements for admission. Uh, okay, next question from Walter. 
does Java certificate from Oracle count for object-oriented programming? Um, so in terms of meeting the prerequisite requirements, the preference is um, that the prerequisites are taken for graded trans transcripted credit. And the reasoning for that is that there is a level of uh, continuity or there is a, a, a bar there, a basic um, level of um, understanding that if it is, you know, it is for transcripted credit from an institution, it is likely accredited and we are, there are the same standards are being met. Whereas some of these um, boot camps and uh, open MOOCs or specializations, they are not graded. Um, there's no good way to measure what is being taught or learned in those. Um, let's see, next up. I recently completed my bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering, and I want to apply for MCS in fall 23. Oh, fall 23, geez, jumping ahead. What are the prerequisites and requirements for that and any suggestions from your side to build up a good, prof good profile to get admitted? Um, so who wants to take that one? Anyone, anyone? You want me to go? Go for it, thank you. So, um, oops, the question went away, all right. Oh, I'm um, sorry. No, that's They're, okay. Oh. Okay. So um, consider what classes you have taken, because it is, it's fairly, it's a fairly closely related mm -hmm. um, um, degree program, depending on where you take the, um, where you went to school. So see if you have taken your class, second the classes in um, data structures, algorithms, object-oriented programming, any other computer science classes. And if you meet those basic requirements, that's uh, foundational to the, um, to the MCS or MCSDS program, then, and you have done well in those classes, then we would say um, you you are already setting yourself up for a, for a, you know for a strong application. If you don't have those classes, and um, even though your degree is in um, ECE and very uh, closely related, you would still want to look at other options to meet those uh, foundation requirements, and that could include taking a class, even though you're graduating, taking a class maybe from another local institution, or if you're still taking classes, see if you can fit something into your schedule if you have time between now and the time you graduate. That might be the best option if you have time um, to strengthen your application. I think that really would be my best answer. Because ultimately, regardless of what your um, bachelor's degree is, we would be looking for those foundations. Mm -hmm. um, Great. And I thank want to say you. thank you to Nadim on the chat space. I am not um, a Dr. Viveka. I am Viveka, and you can feel free to use my first name. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, next question. Can you take a course without enrolling in the degree program? Lisa, this is you. Yeah, so this would be where taking a course as a non-degree student comes into play. So um, earlier it said that yeah, our online MCS courses are open to non-degree students, but registration is limited to some specific classes. Um, that um, may still have enrollment capacity after our degree seeking students have registered. I don't think that's been determined yet for spring 2022. Um, but yeah, typically we have a handful of courses each semester that non-degree students can take um, prior to, um, you know, maybe they just wanna try out a course um, or they wanna strengthen their application. Um, before they actually apply for the online MCS and MCSDS. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, um, please reach out to um, online-mcs at cs.illinois.edu, our email address, and we can send you details on, um, on the courses that are being offered and how you might register for this. Okay, great, thanks Lisa. Okay, um, are there, is there any course in MCSDS that is based in Python language? Um, so like we said previously, um, a lot of the, um, most courses will allow you to use 
you know, your preferred uh, programming language, but some are very specific. Um, we would recommend that you look at the sample syllabi that's posted to the program to see what the language requirements are. Um, we know that uh, cloud computing applications can be completed in Python, for instance, but Java is encouraged as well. But I can't think off at the top of my head which course specifically requires Python, but the best thing to do would be look at, to look at those sample syllabi. Next question, how would we interact with peers? How, also, how is the personal project space and portfolio building taken care of? So the program has numerous channels for interaction um, and collaboration. Um, we do have specific Slack channels for students in the program. And within that, there are specific course Slack channels. And of course, students can always build their own Slack channels. There's also, uh, we use Campus Wire for the program. Um, that's another um, collaborative channel for individuals to, to chat on. Uh, students can set up office hours. All students have access to Zoom once they have, um, and everybody has Zoom these days, but students meet via Zoom. Um, we also, you know, we also have students who, if they're in very, in the, if they're in the same metro area, I know that students do uh, form study groups and actually physically meet with each other. Um, so there's various ways to interact with your peers and also with the course staff and the faculty. Um, every, all the courses have live office hours, which allows you to interact with your peers that way and both course staff and faculty. Okay. How many people are usually in the program? Uh, a lot. Let's say. <laughs> Uh, so currently, the the we don't have a cap on admissions per se. We admit um, those who are um, you know admissible, eligibly or academically um, admissible. Right now, our program where our enrollment, our current enrollment is around I would say between fourteen hundred, close to fifteen hundred, and that. Flux, you know, that flux is depending on the time of year. Students tend to take a break during the summer, whereas fall and spring, we have a lot higher enrollment. Um, and I think that about answers that one. Um, and then it looks like Vivica is answering the last question in the queue. So if there are numerous questions, we may be able to end this one early. Anything else? To, does anyone have anything else to add from the group? Oh, here's a question. Okay, um, I am okay. I am in, I am from India and currently working in U.S. with H-1B visa. If I am able to join the course, and suppose I move out from U.S. to my country, would that be okay? Uh, who wants to take that one? I'll take it. Uh, yeah, so we have students all over the world, um, and so you don't necessarily have to be in the U.S. to be able to be in this program. Um, so as long as you have internet access and are not in an embargoed country, you can take your courses from there. Very good. Thank you. We should also say, and if you are from a country that may have um, export embargoes, Please talk to us and we can let you know if if you will not be able to take classes. I'm just putting this out as a general comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael has a question. How important is having relevant program experience in your current job? Um, well, I guess we could just say it's important to have programming experience, whether or not it's with your current job is another, you know, another thing. So really what we're looking for is that you have the programming experience versus whether or not you do that in your current job. Yep, okay. Would this degree allow you to pursue a PhD later? PhD I'm gonna later. take that one. Yes, thank you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> so our uh, MCS program is all course-based and our expectations are that if students are interested in further and understanding about research that they take our, they come into our campus and take an on-campus uh, thesis-based master's program because trying to uh, 
get into a PhD program, they're going to evaluate your research skills. And there's very little uh, ability for us to be able to evaluate research skills for students taking online classes. So we're happy to talk to you about what you should do if you're interested in a PhD. But if you are interested in a PhD, this, I'm not gonna say this is the wrong program for you. I mean, you can do this and then try to figure out how to move on, but it is not an easy path from the online MCS program or from even from our on-campus MCS program into our PhD program. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Okay, Kevin has a question. I had, uh, he took the data structures exam a couple days ago. Unfortunately, he um, did not meet the minimum grade requirement. Um, his undergraduate GPA was under three, but the first master's program is a 3.5, but not a STEM degree. Will I still be considered for admission for spring? And so really in this situation, um, it's really, um, as Desiree had mentioned earlier, the graduate college requires a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. Um, it would be reviewed. Certainly the 3.45 GPA in the graduate degree will also be considered, um, but we'd really, the graduate college really puts an emphasis on that graduate, um, undergraduate degree for admission. So Kevin, unfortunately, we can't give you a definitive answer uh, at this moment. Um, we'll have to review the full application packet to be able to make an informed decision. Okay. Um, I noticed that there are two metrics. One is CGPA in four years and GPA from last two years. What if my GP only satisfies one of these two metrics? So um, let's see. Oh, I think I skipped a question there. Um, let's see, Desiree, you want to take that one? Which one? The metrics? Yes. What's the, the difference between cumulative GPA and then cumulative, cumulative GPA for four years and the two years? Yeah. So for admissions, um, what the graduate college is looking for is for that last two year um, GPA um, in order to be admitted. Um, so that needs to be a 3.0 or above. Um, certainly we'll look at all of the coursework and all of the educational records. We review applicants holistically to see um, if they would be a good fit for the program or not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are all courses an online presentation? Can we sometimes talk about projects courses with a professor? So all of the lectures are online. Um, and um, as I mentioned previously, you would have the opportunity to talk to instructors. All, in, all of the courses have live office hours. Um, and you can interact with your faculty that way. Um, of course, you can also email with your faculty. Um, uh, they're open. Uh, they're open and are always willing to speak to their students. Okay, let's see. Oh, the questions are moving. Okay, if you are not accepted on first try, will you explain what the deficiency was and what needs to be changed to get accepted? That's a great question. And so. All of the uh, application admission requirements are posted to the website. Um, and so if someone receives a denial letter, um, the department does not speak to specific decisions for the denial, we will refer you to um, the application admission requirements. Um, pretty, because if, you know, most of, I would say 99% of the time, if you hit all of those requirements, your chances of getting admitted are pretty good. Um, if you're missing something, then that's where the deficiency is. And um, we would ask that you review your application to make sure that you've hit all of those um, requirements. Um, if the latest transcript includes the coursework from previous colleges, is it sufficient to submit that latest transcript or do I need to submit transcripts from previous college? Lisa, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, if I'm understanding correctly, you um, maybe had took some courses at another college um, before transferring to another college to complete your bachelor's degree. In that, in that case, um, and in any case, um, we uh, require that applicants upload a 
transcript for every single institution that they've attended. Even if that's 10 institutions, we want to see all of your transcripts. And it's a lot, lot to, to upload and a lot for us to go through, but it really gives us the complete picture of your academic history. And the graduate college um, policy does require that you upload um, a transcript for each, um, for each college that you've attended, um, even if it's just one class, upload the transcript. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that, um, in situations where we see that, for instance, if you attended five institutions, but you only uploaded one transcript that listed all the courses from the other institutions, in that situation, we would send you an email and say, hey, can you please upload the other four transcripts? Thanks. <laughs> so it just makes it easier, makes it, the review process quicker if you just upload everything that's required. Um, we do our best to send reminders out, but after a certain point, um, if we are not seeing the information that's required, it's impossible for us to do a complete review. And the chances of you know, having a positive outcome um, for admissions um, is small. So, Robin, I think I'm gonna ask you to answer this next one that's been sitting at the top here. Um, my work experience is more into C++ application level programming. Any suggestion which course will be beneficial for me? So again, I think we're gonna go back to this comment that we don't uh, really consider what programming languages different students know or don't know. Our expectations are that you, that you will or have learned the skills to pick up new programming languages. So when you say that you wanna be more in the application level space, you should look for those classes. But um, this is a, a full, a program with breadth requirements across many different areas that um, you should really consider what, you know, what classes to take that are interesting to you and not based on what programming language you know. Mm -hmm. It may be easier at the beginning to say, take the cloud computing class because uh, I, I assume that's either, that that's a class you could do in C++, but I wouldn't restrict yourself to picking classes based on the programming language. You know, if all you want to do is learn programming languages, you can do that online. Here, you're 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 here to learn, you know, content, and and specifics and theory and and process, and not just the programming language itself. Excellent, thank you, Robin. Okay. Oh, <laughs> my goal is quick. Oh, so close. <laughs> Okay, do students interested in doing research have an alternative have alternative options as far as that goes? For example, even if there aren't any research baked into the program, can students take the extra step to connect with professors and get involved in research that way? I'll, I'll answer that one as well. Sure. So um, our expectations are that students on our online MCS program are not going to get in, involved in research. You can reach out to the faculty members but it is very likely that they are that they are focused on the students that are on campus doing research with them on campus uh, who are enrolled in research-based programs as compared to a class-based program so the ms or the phd programs are thesis-based programs that are where research is being done the mcs program is a class-based program and your applications were not evaluated for research skills. So again, it's something that we were not, you know, expecting students coming into this program. Now, that being said, you can always try, mm -hmm. but you may, it, it will, it, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, hill to climb to get faculty engaged in research uh, from this program. Okay, thank you. Um, and Nadim, is just, he's got her back. He's saying this is a top five MCS and CS. It's academic rigor. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, will we, we ever consider adding an online thesis MSCCS? I can tell you at this point in time, our thesis based programs are all on campus. Um, what happens in the future? You know, everything changed these last years, this last year and a half, two years with COVID and what we've been willing to and, and what we can do online. But thesis, thesis and research require interactions with our faculty members and our thesis-based programs are 
right now exclusively on campus programs. Okay. All right, and then one last question. Um, Shrisma is wondering, uh, so he's applied um, for last term and they were denied and are wondering why. So again, we recommend you really look over the admission requirements and see if they align with what you had submitted in your applications. Um, if there's anything that was misaligned, um, you know, we, we ask you to consider how you could meet those requirements going forward. And you're always welcome to apply. You can apply as many times as you like. Okay. Um, okay, Walter, this is really the last question. Okay, so Walter is wondering um, if he wants to publish, he wants to publish, are there any resources available? Um, Robin, could you speak to that? I'm not quite sure I understand. That uh, if you mean it. publish research papers, uh, again, um, you know, if you're working with a faculty member, absolutely that faculty member has resources for you, but our expectations are that our students in our MCS program are not uh, necessarily working with faculty to publish research papers. Can I add to that um, just yeah. a little bit? We do have sometimes our students, um, and these are mostly students in our research programs who will actually publish as like, with peers. So, and in some of these classes, you may find on-campus students who are taking these classes. So it, it's, it's possible, is it, it's an option that you may be able to find someone who's willing to work with you partner and publish. But again, as I said, um, the goal for this program is um, to earn a degree that is coursework based that allows you to, um, you know, advance in your careers, mostly in industry. <laughs> okay, great. So that concludes this session. I want to thank um, all of the panelists and thank you for your time today. Again, this session is recorded. You will receive a recording of this um, via email. So thanks everybody and have a good weekend.